Do you find yourself searching through your fabric stash for the perfect coordinates? Do you strive to be more confident in your color combinations? If you answered yes or just love fabric, then a subscription to Goodies Color Club is for you. Goodies Bundle Club is a quarterly subscription program with carefully curated fabric bundles by me sent right to your doorstep. I handpick every fabric in each delivery with 12 half yard pieces, which will only be available to Goodies Bundle Club members. In addition to an exclusive Stash Builder Bundle, each delivery includes a booklet of information on the fabrics I have chosen, the fabric designer, additional fabric suggestions to use with a bundle, and quilt patterns that would be a perfect pairing with the fabric. Hi, my name is Gudrun from GE Designs and welcome to our Tipsy Tuesday show. Hi everybody and welcome to our show. We thank you so much for being here. It's always great and if you're watching us during this live premiere on YouTube, make sure you introduce yourselves in the comments, say hi and everything. We are not live. We had to pre-record today's episode, but we still did not want to make, make sure we missed a day. So thank you all for being here. Now today I'm going to keep it pretty similar to what we do on Tuesdays. I'm going to start off with a great tip of the day. And this one is one that you've been waiting for. I know it's all about how you can put cuddle or minky on the back of your quilt and then use it to bring around as binding. So kind of a self binding technique. And then I'm going to have some great fabrics to show you some brand new fabrics in the store. And finally, we're not done. Helene is going to finish us off today with a great tutorial. So she's going to show you guys an easy way to do beautiful chenille work. But let's get started and kick it off with my tip of the day. Hi, my name is Gudrun from GE Designs and in this video I'm going to show you how to self 
find a quilt if you're using a minky or cuddle backing. That is, bring that backing around to the front and use it as binding. So let's get started. First, I'm going to talk about the tools that are very helpful for uh, this process. So I'm going to be using a Sharpie pen. You can use a Sharpie, but any other kind of a, a, a marker pen would work as well. I also have my chalk pen. You can also use a air, uh, water erasable pen, whatever works for you. Good scissors. I really love using a stiletto. This is a stiletto by, I, by Annie. Um, it's a nice and sharp to hold things in place, and I'll show you a couple uses for it. Then uh, you, what you want are actually flower head pins. When you're working with cuddle that is longer or minky, they tend to, your l regular ball head pins tend to get lost in the, in the minky. So I like these flower head pins and this is for lightweight fabrics, for sheer lightweight fabrics. Uh, you also want to use a stretch needle for your sewing machine whenever you're working with minky or cuddle because it is a woven and also polyester thread. I, I'm going to show you how to use this ruler for some of our markings, but any ruler with a 45 degree line on it works uh, well, uh, as, works the same way. So let's start. So what I have done here, I have both a large quilt that I have finished and I'm just finishing the binding on. But as for ease of uh, showing you, I have a little small sample here. So first thing you want to do with your quilt and your backing, uh, your batting. So whenever you're going to use cuddle or minky to bring around, you don't want to do just a quarter inch. That's just going to drive you crazy because that is very narrow. I also tend to not do this unless my quilt has a border or where the points don't, don't come out to the edge because it's sometimes really hard to get like a perfect placement of the cuddle and as you can see it kind of fluffs up around the edge so you might lose some of your design if you have points coming out to the end. So how I do this, uh, you, I usually do at least a half inch binding, usually three quarters or an inch. So what that means is I have my quilt top here uh, represented in the red and then you want to, your batting that is excess after you've quilted it, you want to trim that to a certain size. So for this part I trimmed it uh, one inch larger than my quilt top. So that's, that's what I, I drew. You can see that with my marker. And then you want to just make sure you trim that. And you can do it uh, right away, just with scissors, before you mark your minky. So in this case, I did a one inch or a half inch batting on the quilt. I actually did three-fourths of an inch because I want the binding to become an inch. So the binding on this one will only become three-fourths. So once you've trimmed your batting to the same size as um, on the cut it on the drawn lines, you, you'll see you have a half inch batting all the way around the top. So then you want to mark your, your cuddle or your minky. So this was a half inch. So now you want to mark from the edge of the batting to the cuddle, you want to uh, mark a quarter inch wider spot because you need that, that cuddle to overlap into your quilt top. So I just took my, my ruler and made marking so it's a uh, three-fourths of an inch larger on all sides. For the large quilt, it was easy because that was just an inch from, from the edge of the batting. And one great thing about uh, when you're doing these markings is using this tripology ruler. On my small piece, obviously uh, the ruler is too big, but it worked really great for my large quilt. So I'm going to show you because on, the, on both sides you have three dotted lines and then uh, to the first slit on each side there's exactly an inch. So I could use my side and put that third line on the edge of my quilt top, mark my batting, and then I could just put the first slit on that marking and mark my cuddle an inch from that. So a great tool to use. You will also have two lines here on the top. So make sure you check that out if you're doing a larger quilt. 
But we are here, and so now, as you can see, I have marked the outside of my, my backing. And so now we are going to mark our corners. So we want to have a really nice mitered corner, so when you flip it over, it's just gonna miter right in that, in that corner here. So there's two ways to do this. You can either cut your corner at an angle, and I'm gonna show you how to do that. I take a ruler that has the 45 degree angles on both sides, and you wanna mark that from the corner of the batting. So I can just lay this one so it's aligned here and on this side and make my marking. I'm just going to use this um, chalk marker. I don't know if you can see. Let me do it in, in uh, Sharpie so that you can easily see it. And then, then what we're going to do is just cut that. So I'm going to cut this angle. And here's a, a nice trick. If you have real longer fibers on your cuddle or minky, just go right under it, cut it from the back versus cutting it with uh, a rotary cutter and just cut through that backing layer and then you're not cutting through all of those fibers. So there's minimal shedding. There's always gonna be shedding just on the seam, but it's not gonna fray or shed anymore after that. So I always have uh, a little shop vac, a little handy vac in my sewing room that I can do that with, or you can have a little um, lint roller here to pick it up. So also you want to cut the, the sides to uh, size as well. So I'm going to cut those off on both sides. You obviously want to go this way. So then the first thing you do once you have cut all your sides is sew this angle. And now that I've cut it at this angle, all I got to do is fold this up and pin it. So you can fold your, your quilt like this. You can pin it and then sew with a quarter inch seam. Now a little bit easier way would be to mark this and sew first before you trim. So here I have um, a corner. So then you want to draw the line. If you're drawing the stitching line, you want to draw it all the way up to the corner. So instead of using this ruler where it's a quarter inch from the corner, I'm just going to pull it down a little bit so that my edge of my ruler is is hitting that corner of the of the batting like this and I first want to cut my sides all the way so that's trimmed even you can of course do this with a rotary cutter just know if you're going to do it with a rotary cutter you're going to get a little bit more fluff and also you might want to use a mat that you don't uh, kind of a, a little bit of a beat up mat because it's going to get into your uh, cutting mat. But the best trick is to have a little vac in your sewing room and catch this. So now I have drawn this. So all you got to do, do now is fold it over. And then you just match up those two, two lines that you draw. So on this side and the other side. And you want to pin. So I'm going to grab my flower head pins. And you want to pin on both sides. I want to pin it. Let's double check in here. It's matching up. Looking good. So I'm going to pin it on one side of the line and then on the other side of the line. So now you're just going to stitch along the line and then trim that little corner off. So either way, whether you Cut it first and just pin and sew with a quarter inch seam. Or do it this way, it's going to end up with the same result. And so one thing that you want to do too, when you're sewing the corners, because you want to make sure that these outer edges are even. So I always start sewing from the outer edge and into the folded edge. So start here and back stitch and go all the way down to the folded edge. So then you would trim that off and you will have a sewn corner like this. So you trim everything off and now we're just going to fold this over and you kind of push that in to the corner and you're going to get a nice mitered corner 
and you'll see now that this is going to go over your edges by a quarter quarter of an inch. So now all we got to do is stitch this down. So you're kind of skipping a step where we sew the binding down um, and then we flip it over the edge and then we sew all the way around again. So we're just doing this once. So um, the great thing about the Cuddle and Minky because this is a woven, this is never going to ravel. So we can have a raw edge all along our quilt here and not even worry about it. So I'm just pulling this over. Another step you can do if you want it to draw a little line onto your quilt top to have a guide to where you want that minky to land you can do that but i just like to pin it in place again this time i'm pinning this way so normally when we're piecing we're pinning the opposite way but now i'm just pinning this way so before i am ready to stitch my binding down so i pin all the way around and now I'm ready to get to my sewing machine. So what I want there is polyester thread that matches my minky or cuddle. Um, and then you can do a couple of things with your stitches. You can do uh, a little bit of a serpentine stitch, which kind of just does a little wave. Make sure it's not too wide. But I like to just do a zigzag. So I want it rather about three, I set it to a three millimeter wide. And then make sure that it's fairly long as well, so about three millimeter long. And so when I am stitching, I actually want to go on the uh, just the outside when it zigs to the left to just kind of be right outside the minky or the cuddle. And then when it zigs to the right, you go into it. So it goes this way across as you as you go, and then you can remove the pins as you go down. I actually shot a little video of me when I was stitching a part of this larger quilt down. So let's take a look at that. So as you have stitched down all the way around, as you can see, it's really nice to use that uh, stiletto to kind of push the fibers out of the way so you can really see as you're doing your zigzag, really see the edge of the fabric. So I'm going to show you now on my larger quilt here. So I zigzag through the from about here and then all the way through the corner and out this way. So on the back side, I, I used a gray bobbin thread here for this corner but I would obviously do it with with just a nice uh, teal color matching my cuddle but it really still gets hidden really nicely so once you have this stitch uh, sometimes you will see how the edge gets a little bit flattened so what you want to do is just take your stiletto and kind of just pull those fibers out of the out of the seam and kind of ruffle it a little bit and it will really change the way it looks. It really hides that stitch all the way through. I do that with my corners too. I can show you on this one. So after you sew a corner, you will see that they kind of flatten 
And so all you got to do is kind of pull that out, and you'll see that it gets nice and fluffy and um, very, very forgiving. So it's a great way to do a binding when you maybe don't matter too much if you hit to a point, but it's um, something that's very forgiving, very fun for a look, great for kids or any kind of quilts that you, you really want to cuddle with on the couch. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little tip, which was a little bit more than just a small tip. It was, of course, a whole tutorial. But if you have any questions, you can definitely post those in the comments, and we will try to answer those um, a little bit later. And if you have any questions uh, when we post on Facebook, same thing. Post them in our, in our comments or send us an email. But it's time for some beautiful new fabrics. I got two lines to show you today. Really different, but that's what we love. And there's something for everybody in our store. So let's start off with a fabric line for those golfers out there. So we have a beautiful line, new line called Front Nine. And this one is, comes with a panel. The panel is not included in the fabric bundle, but I wanted to show you this one first because I thought it was really a great one. So we have these square images, which measure to about, um, I want to say, 10 inches. So you could cut them at 10 and a half, include them into a quilt. They could be, of course, made into a little bag, anything like that. And so six images to the panel, and the panel is sold separately. But I just love the artwork. I think it's really beautiful, even though I'm not an avid golfer. I do enjoy it, but just don't have that much time for it. So the fabric bundle is an eight piece bundle. So I'm gonna start off with this really beautiful scenery print. So if this doesn't uh, kind of put you in the mood to go golfing, all the golf carts on the greens and on the, on the fairways, just beautiful. And then there's the hole. So I think this is really cool and it is just, um, a, a repeat yardage so it's not anything to cut out so it's just continuous I love that so the second green print is the golf balls there's eight pieces in this collection in the bundle which is perfect for you know novelty prints like this then we have a little bit of a tan taupey background with the golfer <coughs> Now this one looks like he's in the sand pit. That, that color kind of looks like that. Um, then we have the golf balls again on the kind of a lighter gray background. I love the shading in here. We have a print that has the golf clubs, some golf clubs and golf balls, and a really nice colorful one. This is our fourth light fabric. A bunch of teas. And then uh, this is probably one of my favorites. We have a little Argyle print. I love this one. So this one is really graphic, a little bit larger scale. And then we have the last one is a black, really geometric. But if you look closely, these are golf tees. Love this. So this is the whole line, eight pieces. And then, of course, the uh, panel, if you wanted to add that and do something fun with it. But I did do a pull. So let's start with some beautiful greens. The flow in the green is a perfect match. I love the difference in shade here. It really matches that background here. A little bit brighter, the textures and the pebble lime really match the lighter tones of the green in this print. Going into some of the more lighter colors, uh, I love this spectrostatic mimeograph. It just has a, kind of these specks in it, kind of like sand flying. And then uh, kind of a pretty much a white, the So Happy Thread Toss. It really matches the real white in uh, this print here. So then we have something for this blue color. I love the seeds in the azure. 
And then also a little bit lighter, the spectrostatic baby blue, which is a perfect match with this blue in here. A little bit more black to kind of tie it all together. The seeds in the charcoal, I love that it has the white in it, so it ties really nicely together. And then the spotted celestial also has white to tie all together. And then I found a beautiful plaid that would work perfectly to frame anything, the diagonal plaid in the uh, late October in the black. <clears throat> so what to do with a golf themed fabric? Of course, I know you probably have some great golfers that you know for gifts, but I thought a good idea to take some of the towels uh, or a towel, the technique that I showed you on our Tipsy Tuesday, a couple, or on our Happy Friday a couple of weeks ago, you could instead of have toweling, you could get those really nice small golf towels and sew, use some of the fun fabrics to sew this top so it could be hung kind of on your golf cart or on your little, on your bag or anything, so a little golf towel. So check that out, this is front nine. Really cool colors, and I love the artwork. So this next one is another, a little bit fall inspired line. This is uh, by Janet Nesbitt. I really love her stuff, Henry Glass, and it's called Stand Tall. And a little bit, the, f the title doesn't really tell you what it is, but if you think about sunflowers, of course, then it makes sense. Stand tall. So I really love this take on a sunflower print. It's very muted, beautiful colors. And so this is the main print. And then we have some more goals. I kind of um, decided to use most of the colors in the line because they just flow really nicely together. So another smaller print with all of the same tones, a, a tad bit darker. And this is what I love about her lines, even though they read pretty traditional, but then she throws in a geometric that could read very modern. So she kind of breaks it up a little bit. And we have another tone on tone, just little excess, a little bit lighter yellow. So it kind of has all the tones of the golds in the sunflowers. Then we bring you this rusty red. Uh, I think this is really pretty with the small flowers and the same triangle print here uh, with all these different tones. I love the lightest, there's a bunch of mediums and the darkest hues all together. It gives a lot of movement in there. A little bit of green, we have that geometric print that we had here, kind of acts like a plaid. And the other green kind of acts like a stripe. These little zigzags, little chevron pattern, but very subtle. So it wouldn't necessarily have to read like a, a stripe. Now this beautiful blue, grayish blue color that she uses a lot, and, and I love that because it's nice and warm. Um, it reads, it's showing a little bit bluer than it really is, I think, on the camera. So it is a really nice, dusty, teal kind of color. And then we have another tone on tone, little birds and little flowers, so a little bit lighter hue of, of this one here. So make a little more room here. There we go. We have that same print that we have the green in a nice taupey brown, soft brown color. And then that same bird print in a lighter version of that, which has quite a bit of red, so it ties in with the reds here. So this is our stand tall. So I have kind of a nice mixture between lights and darks, easy to play with. I also have some of the colors in one yards. We have the sunflowers in one yards on the gold. We have the red sunflower or little small flowers and then also the blue color, the taupe color, um, not taupe, teal color in, in, the, in one yards. So as far as other colors, I just kind of played with a range because there's such a range within here. So we're going to start on the gold side with the pebbled path and the golden yellow. And then I decided to pull a little bit deeper for some of the deeper tones of the gold, the flights of fancy in the gilded. So 
has a little bit of cinnamon tone to it. For the darker red, the spectrostatic in the brick is perfect, a perfect tone with it. And then uh, all the hues in here, I love this with it, the deco stitch and the rosebud. A beautiful fabric that has some of the darker tones in it as well. For the green, grunge juniper reads perfectly, has a little bit of olive hue to it, but it works very well with it. And then kind of an in-between, um, a green and this, this beautiful bluish tone is the bumbleberries and the dark sea. So that's the darker version. And then the bumbleberries and the iced sage is almost perfect with uh, the lighter one. So it really blends the greens and the blues well together. For the browns, since there's only one, I thought it'd be great to add a couple. So the deco stitch and the timber wolf works nicely. And then the thatched cocoa, also a little bit warmer tone. Uh, read some of the darker tones in, the, in there. And that last piece here that, uh, that has that little bit of a lavender hue to it, a little reddish gray, the bumbleberries and the smoky charcoal is almost a perfect match with this one. So this is our Stand Tall by Henry Glass, designer Janet Nesbitt. Beautiful, beautiful, ready for fall. Hi, I'm Colleen from GE Design. I'm here today to talk about the chenille technique. It's one of my favorite techniques, frankly, to give my projects a little bit of texture and a little bit of pizzazz. Let me show you what I mean. On the left here, I have a pillow that you might have seen if you watched the uh, One Yard Wednesday shows. During one of the One Yard Wednesdays, I was promoting the, this line of green color fabrics and I thought, what can I do with this solidish green to give it a little something? So I did my chenille technique and then I made this into a pillow and it really does, is a nice add to my decoration. Today's example is a, another pillow. I love making pillows using the chickadee room to grow in the cloud colorway. And this is a really pretty floral pattern. This will really look beautiful in my home in the, um, in the, here in the spring and summer. The chenille technique is really simple. I'm going to layer my fabrics. I'm going to, to sew channels on the diagonal so that I get this nice chenilling um, uh, effect. And then I'm, once they're cut, I'm going to cut them using my slasher cutter. Let me show you those tools. The first tool I want to remember to show you is the, is Insulbrite. And I love Insulbrite as the batting or the, the interfacing, if you will, for my chenille projects that are used in the kitchen. I use two layers of this along with three layers on top fabric and one layer for the backing fabric. Of course, if I'm not in the kitchen, I can use my cotton batting. I can use our quilt as you go batting. Really, all, all, any of these will do. My go-to tool for chenille is the Slash Cutter by Clover. The, the Slash Cutter has a small rotary blade here in this slot. The guide helps to pick up the fabric so you can slide right through here. The guide on the cutter right now is used for more curvy cuts. The longer guide is used for more straight cuts, and I'll show you both examples of those. You can also turn the wheel so that you maintain the sharpness of this, and this, will, uh, this blade will last you a long time. My second tool that is a kind of a surprising one is Aunt Pam's quilt sponge. So we love this quilt sponge because it's great for cleaning up your mat. In chenille, it's great for giving you just enough friction on your fabrics to give that chenille effect. So grab Aunt, uh, Aunt Pam's and put these aside. Let's, let's take a look at the technique. I have two samples here, one straight cut and one curvy cut. 
give you that uh, a couple of things. It gives you the, the visual of how different the straight versus the curvy look. This one gives me so much more texture. It's really fun. Um, so let's just go step by step. Both of these have a backing fabric that's the same as the top. That's just coincidence. It wouldn't need to be. For my pillow, I usually use something that's in my scrap bag because it's going to be hidden inside my pillow anyway. But I have one layer of backing. I have two layers of Insulbrite. I don't in this one. I'm going to be honest about it. But I, I would always have two. And then I have three layers of cotton for the top. One, two, three. And the same is true on this one. I used a cotton batting on this example. Then, for the straight cuts, I am going to sew corner to corner first on the diagonal. And the diagonal is important because that's how you um, are able to get these loose threads. I do, now this is a generous distance I sewed in between the dots here. Just as a reminder that you can use your print as your guide when you're doing this quilting or you can use your presser foot, or you could draw these lines if you really wanted to. You need about a quarter to three-eighths of an inch, at least, between your stitching lines. In this example, I just went curvy, curvy, curvy. I didn't draw a line. You can even see that the curves are all a little bit different one from the other. Um, another tip on quilting these is if you quilt this one, this stitch line, for example, from here down, you'll turn it around and stitch this one from here down this way. Going back and forth and back and forth means that this will end up staying in its square. If you just went straight down again and again and again, that it would start to move on you. Um, another tip here is I, I layered my top two fabrics just a little bit shy of the width of the bottom fabric, and you'll see how helpful that is. When I go to cut this fabric, I can see that my cutter, let me use the longer one, my cutter is between the two top fabrics and the bottom one fabric, and that is harder to do when you can't see that fabric for sure. So that's a, a great handy tip that I sometimes forget to even follow myself. So I'll put this in here, give it a little push and a little curve, and it's ready to go. And I can go back here and do the same thing. Isn't that fun? And then over here, the same thing, only on the straight. So I'm going to find the top two and just cut through. And I want, just a reminder, I want to keep that first layer intact. Then I grab Aunt Pam's sponge and I give this a little bit of a rough up and that is how I get that chenille effect. So I used to have to throw these in the washer and the dryer to get this chenille effect. I don't have to do that anymore. I can just do the um, Aunt Pam sponge. There is a tool on the market sold for this purpose and it's a brush. But it has wire teeth, and it's actually a little bit too aggressive for our cottons. I, I tried it, and I didn't know it. So there you go. That's how simple this technique is. Very easy and fun to do. Uh, let's look at the pillow again and some other fabric candidates that would make great chenille, and then we'll close with looking at the tools. This is the Chickadee Room to Grow Cloud. Um, if you're looking for this on our website, grab a yard of this. You'll need a yard in order to get this 18 by 18 fab, uh, pillow because you need three layers lined up exactly. I think this is so fun, and there's the little chickadee hiding in the flowers here. This floral print is beautiful, and here it is. So it, I think, and it's fun to look at this before it's chenilled, and you can see how much texture the chenille process gives it. So that would be right about here in this, in this print. Also in Chickadee Room to Grow, it, we have Chickadee Dusk. This would also be very cool, give you a darker vibe, of course, but um, really pretty with these great big florals. I think these are fun projects for seasonal kinds of images. So 
this would be a great runner or great pot holders. This is Holiday Spirits Santa Cheers. And some of these prints, you know, you're wondering, those are super cute. What would I do with these? I wouldn't want to make a quilt necessarily out of the Santa, but a pot holder, a trivet, posters, those would all be really fun. Also in the more seasonal prints, I have Winter Hollow Scenic Multi. That one is equally pretty, obviously a different vibe than Santa, but would be so pretty. I have a couple more florals. Rendezvous Crimson. This is another large scale floral, which would be real pretty. And then my favorite is the Mon Cheri Lake. Mon Cheri Floral Lake. So again, it's going to give me that vibe of that lake in the background with these flowers coming off in that chenille texture. So, so pretty. I hope you like this chenille texture. Let me remind you of the tools that are going to be so helpful. First of all, the non-stick sewing machine needle, the 9014 or the 8012, would, either one would work great. I used the 8012 for this and it was perfect. The must-have is the Slasher Cutter, and it is by Clover. You can go, of course, for all these products to GEQuiltDesigns.com and grab these. The Slasher Cutter is, has the attachment for the curvy channels as well as the straight channels, and really very good tips and instructions in the packaging here. So take a minute to look at that. Finally, Aunt Pam's sponge. You may have one for cleaning up your mat. Grab it for, um, for texturing up your chenille, and uh, the th you can clean it by pulling the threads off, and you're ready to go. So that is our chenille technique. I hope you liked it. Watch for a blog. I'll put the products out there, and I'll put some more ideas. And certainly, if you make a, pro a project using the chenille technique, post it at GE Designs on Facebook or the GE Crew. We would love to see it. I'm Colleen from GE Designs. Have a great day. Well, this is our show today. I hope you enjoyed all the tips and the tutorial, especially the one from Colleen. Thank you, Colleen. I think it was a great show, and I hope you get inspired. Maybe a little bit of fabric fix in there to get you even more inspired. We will be back this coming Friday. That is May 5th, and that's going to be a live show. That's going to be 12 p.m. Central Time. And then I hope I see you next week for uh, Tipsy Tuesday. That's going to be May 9th at 4 p.m. Central, and we'll be live. Can't see, wait to see you there. Bye.